All right, good morning, everybody. Sorry for the delay, just trying to get everything working. So, finally got everything, everything electronic to cooperate. So, Billy, could you lead us in a word of prayer and we'll begin. Thank you, sir. So how is everyone today? Good. We have been studying the book of Jonah. And when last we left Jonah, we didn't get to him last week because of CYC. I um, understand Brett Wallace did a great job. We always appreciate him stepping in and filling in for us. Uh, he seems like a fine young man with a lot of talent and a lot of promise and uh, I wouldn't I would imagine that one of these days he is going to wind up to be a full-time preacher but well two weeks ago when we left Jonah Jonah had been told by God to go to where Nineveh and tell me about Nineveh what kind of people were in Nineveh horrible wicked they were Gentiles they were outside the nation of Israel uh, and what did Jonah think about that Scared, possibly, yeah. We use three P's to describe probably his attitude. Put off. Put off uh, because he was proud, patriotic, and prejudiced uh, because of, you know, these, these were not the children of Israel. They, they were um, very cruel to people. They were uh, Israel's number one enemy. At the time, and so God tells them to go preach uh, to Nineveh so that they might be saved. And, and of course, his what did he do? What did Jonah do? He rejected him and he headed where? Tarshish. And Tarshish was about as far as you could get from uh, going the direction that... God wanted him to go. Isn't that correct? It was almost the complete opposite direction. And it was about as it was effectively the end of the earth for someone of, of Jewish descent. It was uh, Tarshish is believed the most common location that is believed is near the port of Gibraltar in southern Spain. So let's pick up. Well, he gets on a, he gets on a boat in Tarshish. And, uh, or gets on a boat in Joppa and heads to Tarshish. And uh, he's headed that way. And what happens? The sea goes wild. The sea goes wild. There's a big storm. <coughs> and so what happens on the boat? You're ahead of me a little bit. They start calling to who? They st They're gods. Because at that time... Pagan, uh, pagan people, they had all kinds of gods. And so they're all calling to their gods. And then, the, the, uh, and then somebody pick up, that brings us back up to where we are. Somebody read Jonah 1.6 for us, please. Jonah 1.6. Alright, so as we just discussed... Everyone is calling out or crying out to their God. And they want Jonah to call to his. And so here comes this pagan ship captain. And he comes down and he implores, he admonishes an Israelite prophet to pray. Can you see the irony in that? 
Because here is a people that believe in all these different gods, but here is an Israelite prophet who believes in the God, the God of heaven, the one true God. And here's this pagan imploring him to pray. And here, and, and he's not just that he's an Israelite, he's a prophet. God has talked to him. He's communicated to him in some manner. And so here's Jonah, and he knows that he has disobeyed God, and he is trying to flee God. And of course, when we said that, you know, you can't run from God, um, but he's trying to flee his relationship with, with, with God. And so what does he do? He takes a nap. Um, if you ever, and I think we made this point once before, but have you, ever, have you ever just been caught up in some bad decisions and it was just easier just to try to sleep it off? It was just, you know, I, you know if, I'm, if I'm unconscious, then it's not going to bother me, maybe. And so, uh, and plus two, have you ever had something on your mind, weighing on your heart, that was so troublesome that it just it physically exhausted you, even though, you know, maybe the physical effort wasn't there, but just the stress of it. Um, and so, here he is, and, and he is asleep in the bottom of this ship. And I think it's probably a metaphor for people who are spiritually asleep. Because again, you know, if you're just unconscious, if you will, to the problems that you have, especially spiritual problems, then, then, it's, then it's an alternative to dealing with them. And so here he is, and here comes this captain that says, What do you mean, sleeper? And, and quite frankly, I think that continuing that metaphor, I think that sometimes we need to be shaken awake spiritually, just like this captain comes and shakes him awake. And again, don't lose sense of the irony that here's this pagan ship captain telling him to pray to his God. And so somebody read verse 7. We'll move on to verse 7. All right, so there were certain ancient beliefs behind their actions, and it was a common belief that when calamity struck, it was because of someone's sin. Men couldn't predetermine the results of casting lots, and so they believed that their gods affected the outcome, and therefore a, a way of determining the will of their gods and here we see that they cast lots to determine whose guilt in this situation it falls upon, and it falls upon Jonah. Somebody read Proverbs 16, 33. Proverbs 16, 33. Lot is cast into the lap, but every decision is from the Lord. We see that that God's God sometimes uses lots to reveal or communicate His will, according to what Ethan just read in Proverbs sixteen thirty three. And so here, the lot has fell upon Jonah. Now, one observation that I've heard made was that Jonah knew he was the cause of the storm, and I would imagine yes, he probably did. Did jo Jonah knew that he was the reason that everyone's life was in danger, and yet he has said nothing. You know, different cultures undoubtedly cast lots in different ways. I've heard one method described, uh, and I don't know if this was a similar method used here, but but uh, there would be two stones. Um, these stones would be white on one side and black on the other. And the question would be asked, much like asking a magic eight ball. Um, and everybody remember the magic eight ball? And, and then the lots were cast. And if both stones fell black, then the answer was no. If both stones fell white, then the answer was yes. And if it was mixed, well, then it was try again. Um, so 
the observation made went on to point out that this was a lengthy process. The, the, and, and understand that these men, they're in fear for their lives. So here's this lengthy process. This ship is getting just beat about. They're trying to figure out what's the cause so they can try to resolve, to, to make amends with whatever God in their minds is, is angered. Uh, this would have not been a casual conversation. Oh, Renee, hey, go get some stones, will you? You know, we need cast lots. All right, you know, uh, see, see, we're, we're, we're in a bit of a pickle uh, with all this wind, you know. So, um, and Jonah could have ended all of this so much sooner. But again, Jonah had a different plan. And that's been the problem all along. He had a different plan from God. I think you can make the argument that Jonah had a stubborn streak a mile wide. Um, here he is. He's a prophet of God. And, and we can learn that even a servant of God can have things in their life that they need to work on. And Jonah is a, an example of that. And so the lot fell upon Jonah. And everyone's life is in danger. And just imagine just the chaos and the, and the concern you know, and I think I made the point last time we talked about this. You ever been on a boat and, you know, and maybe, you know, the waves, you know, because I, I want to tell a funny story on myself. When uh, we were on our honeymoon, we went to Virginia Beach. And we went out on this sightseeing cruise. And, of course, my dad worked on the river, and I was arrogant and stupid, and I thought that that was genetics. You know, and I just, so I thought the river was like the ocean, and I thought that somehow genetically it was passed down to me, so I was just like, ha, ha, ha. Well, let me tell you something. One good swell, and when my ankles hit my hindquarters, when that boat, that, I didn't fall, but, but, but I, I mean, I don't know what, and it, I, I sat down and was humbled. And, and the guy that was, uh, the deckhand that was on the boat, he just walked around like nothing. And, and, and let me ask you something. It was bad enough on me because that one good swell, it was about a six foot swell and it, it, it drove my heels up into my pockets. And, 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 and it, if he, he had gotten nervous, I was already nervous. If he'd have gotten nervous, oh, I would have been uncontainable. Because, but he just walked around, you know, and that's what's happening here. These guys are just like, you know, hey, this is our job. This is what we do for a living. And we are scared to death. And so they said to him in verse 8, Please tell us, for whose cause is this trouble upon us? What is your occupation, and where do you come from? What is your country, and of what people are you? They started asking questions. Why did they start asking questions? Because, again, they believed, these pagan sailors believed in just a multitude of different gods, depending on where they were from what they did, and so all of these questions were rooted in idolatry. And knowing Jonah's origin could have revealed which deity he had offended. Knowing his occupation could have revealed what his sin was. And also realize that these pagan gods, pagan gods, were restricted by borders. And you can see this mentioned in 1 Kings uh, chapter 20, verse 28. Uh, we won't go there, but, but make note of it and study it on your own. Uh, well, actually, I think we will go there because I didn't look far enough in my notes before I said that. Then a man of God came and spoke to the king of Israel and said, Thus say the Lord, because the Syrians have said, The Lord is God of the hills, but he is not God of the valleys. Therefore, I will deliver all this great multitude into your hand, and you shall know that I am Lord. So they thought that their gods were restricted by borders. And so in the context of what we just read, uh, it, it's they, they were going to have a battle, and they lost the battle so that they thought that, uh, that their opponent's God was over the location that they lost. So if they shifted their location, um, then they would be victorious. They thought that their gods had borders. And so they asked Jonah all these questions, figuring out what his borders were. Somebody read uh, Jonah 1.9. And he said unto them, I am Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. All right, so he leads with, I am a Hebrew, in his answer. 
And we see examples of people doing this in verses like Genesis 40, 15, Exodus 1, 19, Exodus 5, 3, Exodus 10, 3. Um, and we said early on that you could describe Jonah as proud, patriotic, and prejudiced. And so one can ask the question, did he lead with, I am a Hebrew because of his pride and because of his patriotism? Um, I'm sure that all of us are proud to be Americans. Anybody in here not proud to be an American? Don't raise your hand. Just okay. <laughs> Somebody waved at Louise when I said that. <laughs> that was funny. Uh, uh, there's nothing wrong with being proud of where you're from except if you do it to the extent that that pride and that patriotism may cause a problem in that you put it before God. We should never be so patriotic at the expense of spreading God's word or allowing it to cause us to disobey God. And that's what is seemingly happening with Jonah here. So he says, I fear the Lord. Well, let me ask you something. <laughs> Does he? He doesn't fear him enough to do what he said. Uh, he says, if you fear God, you will keep his commandments. So evidently he didn't fear him that much. Exactly. Uh, and so it's an easy thing to say that I fear God. But brethren, we've got to make sure that our actions reveal if we really do. And so his actions, are, are, he, tells, he tells them which God he worships. And he, he clarifies that he's not a worshiper of Baal. And we can see in, in passages like 2 Kings 17, 16, Hosea 2, 8, uh, Hosea chapter 13, Hosea 11, 2, that there were a lot of Israelites that had gone over to worshiping the pagan god Baal. And he describes his God as the God of heaven who made the sea and the land. The God that made the sea they find themselves in, in the middle of right now, in the middle of peril. Somebody read verse 10. What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. They're asking him, how could you have done this? How could you who serve the God that made the sea flee from him? How could you draw his anger and then board our ship, putting all of us in danger? And so here are unbelievers asking questions that Jonah should have already asked himself. We should ask ourselves questions like this on occasion, depending upon what our actions are and what we are involved in. And so, verse 11. So the situation is growing worse and they're searching for ways to make it stop. And they ask him, what should we do? Uh, what shall we do to you? But I want you to notice something. Do they do something immediately? No. Because in verse 12, Jonah answers them and says, Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you. For I know this great tempest is because of me. You know, I would argue that the book of Jonah does not portray Jonah in a positive light. It starts with him fleeing God, and we'll see that it ends with him upset over what God has done for the Ninevites. However, right here at this moment, he acts somewhat selfishly. Selflessly, I think the argument could be made. Um, he says, it's my fault, and I should pay the price, so throw me in. However... While it may have been selfless, there's still a problem. Because here is a prophet of God. Someone, again, who I've made the point, communicates with God. God communicates with him. 
And he should know that God is a forgiving God. When we see God execute judgment, it's almost always after an extended period of willful disobedience. Now, we see exceptions to the, the extended period, Nadab and Abihu, Leviticus 10. We see uh, Uzzah in uh, 2 Samuel 6, Ananias and Sapphira in Acts 5. But those situations deal with errors in worship or lying to the Holy Spirit, things that needed to be dealt with. But just general disobedience, God typically gives us all kinds of room to ask for forgiveness. And so Jonah is a prophet of God and he is not even considering going to God in prayer and saying, I am wrong. Please forgive me and spare these men. His first thought was, throw me overboard. We should know that we need, when we find ourselves lacking to come to God before His throne in prayer and ask for forgiveness. And he may have very well been saying, throw me overboard because I'd rather die than give those people an opportunity to repent, referring to the Ninevites. Let's take a look, a moment to look at some scripture that deals with the importance um, of a prophet and consequences that a prophet faced if somebody could turn to Ezekiel 3 and read 16 through 19. Ezekiel 3 and read 16 through 19. All right, thank you, Jeff. And so basically what we just read tells, it, you know, says, you know, if, if I tell you, prophet, to go and warn these people and you don't do it and they don't turn from their wickedness, then their blood is on your hands. But if I tell you and you do do it and they don't turn, then they shall die from their iniquity. And so Jonah is putting his own salvation at risk because he does not like the Assyrians. I don't know anybody that I've ever had a problem with that I had a problem with to the extent that I'd want to spend an eternity away from God, separated from God, and all the implications that that statement has. Verse 13. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to return to land, but they could not, for the sea continued to grow more tempestuous against them. So even though Jonah had told them to throw him in, these men, they have compassion. They tried not to sacrifice him. There was some goodness in these men. They rode as hard as they could to get to shore, but to no avail. The storm continued to get worse. They tried to do something other than sacrifice him. Somebody read verse 14, please. All right, so as a last resort, the sailors decided that they had to throw Jonah overboard to save the ships themselves. However, before they did so, they prayed to Jonah's God. Now think about that for a minute. Here are these worshipers of pagan gods, and now they're praying to the one true God. And the word that is translated Lord here is the Hebrew word Yahovah. We would say Jehovah. And it is the proper name of God. Um, it would seem that these pagan sailors 
have become believers in the Lord. Now that's not to say that they've forsaken their gods, so it's not a perfect situation, but they're praying to Jonah's God, the one true God of heaven. They did not want the Lord to hold them accountable for taking Jonah's life. Jonah was the one who disobeyed. God had sent the raging storm because of Jonah's disobedience. They were only throwing Jonah overboard to appease God. And, and again, we mentioned irony a while ago. Do you, do you see the irony of a bunch of pagans now praying to the one true God? Somebody read verse 15 and 16. So just as Jonah predicted, the seas calmed and the sailors' lives were spared. And these men, I, I, I mentioned it a while ago, but I would say now that we see clearly that they are believers now because they feared the Lord exceedingly and offered sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. Uh, we don't know if they believed only in the one true God. I would say probably that they didn't forsake their other gods because they were accustomed to believing in many gods. They just added the one true God to the group of gods that they already worshipped probably. But the mo at that moment, he was clearly the God that mattered to them. Um, and so there is just a great deal of irony here. Jonah was a prophet of God uh, who was portrayed as a sinner, and these Gentile sailors were shown to be compassionate. Their righteousness far exceeded that of the prophet. They tried to save Jonah's life. They didn't want to throw him overboard, but they, but they didn't want to die either, so they prayed to God, please don't charge us with innocent blood. Uh, there were, you know, and here's a prophet who communicates to God and God communicates to him, and, and he has yet to go to God in prayer. Um, he had to be exhorted by a ship captain to pray. And so Jonah fleeing from his duty to go preach to Nineveh inadvertently caused these sailors to believe. And it's just, there's so much irony in that. Now here's the one verse that we all know about. Somebody read verse 17. So Jonah goes from being in the hold of the ship, being tossed into the sea, and I, wanna, I want to understand... He was tossed into the sea, and we're going to see what happens to him in chapter 2. And we're going to get to some of it today because we've got time. Uh, I don't know that we'll get through all of it. Uh, but he goes from being on the ship to tossed in the sea. Now verse 17 talks about him uh, being swallowed by the great fish. But understand there's a period of time that, that Jonah comes back and recounts in his prayer to God that we'll see in a minute where he's in the sea and the things that happen to him in the sea. And the reason I mention that is because I always had a misconception about what the whale was as far as God's purpose. But we'll, we'll, we'll get into that in a minute. Uh, but here he goes, aside from his time in the sea, he's thrown overboard, he spends some time in the sea, and then he is swallowed by a great fish. And so let's talk about the fish for a minute. The, the term that's used for fish is a generic term like fish of the sea. Um, and in most translations, um, it uses great fish. Let me pull that up real quick. <clears throat> well, the internet's slow. So the American Standard Version says great fish. Um, other versions that we're familiar with. The ESV says great fish. Um, huh? Huge fish? Did I misspeak? Um, the 
the idea is that it was some kind of waterborne animal that was of the fish variety. In Hebrew, the words are dog gadol, which means great fish. And so I just want to take a moment because there is, there's always this conversation, was it a whale or was it a fish? You know, and we'd see the color sheets and sometimes the great fish has a blowhole uh, and you see water sprouting out. Um, so where do we get whale from? Somebody read Matthew 12, 40. All right, your version says great fish. Huh? Uh, yeah, I was going to talk about how the Greek says whale. In the New Testament, the word is katos. You don't have to write that down. There won't be a test later. But katos means either whale, uh, great fish, or sea monster. And some translations even say sea monster. Um, and so that's where we get whale from. Um, let's not get hung up in that. Um, I think it's great. Took a whale and created it where it would not digest Jonah. Uh, you notice there, it was three days and three nights, so the body didn't see corruption. You know, we see right. that in the Bible. Uh, yeah. A lot of times when we get the whale, I had somebody point this out to me, and I never really thought about it like this. I might put them on the spot since we had some of our, our youngins come in from their Bible class. If I told you to think of an animated story where a little boy got swallowed by a whale, what am I talking about? They're too young. They're, yeah, probably. But it is good talking about, we talk about Pinocchio or we talk about Jonah. He said, sometimes we get these stories in our heads. So mm -hmm. you start telling me about a guy who, you know, disobeyed and he got swallowed. So I'm, I'm reading about Jonah, but in my head I've got Pinocchio. And I get that uh, you know, Jonah was a real boy and all that. But always be kind of mindful of the assumptions and the cultural things that are floating around in your brain that you might not even be really aware about. Exactly. In the Bible. And just, Pinocchio gets spun out after the big old blow hole at the top, and that's why. You know, yeah, because, you know, one of my favorite jokes is where did the little drummer boy stand at the manger? Those that laugh get it. One thing about it, you do know that there was a whale even before this happened. If you go all the way back to Genesis 1, 121, I believe, he created the whale. That was years before this happened. If you think about it, he created the earth, he created man and woman. So he could create any kind of fish as far as any of us. And I'm glad you made that point because some of the arguments that I read in my study was that it's very possible when it says he prepared a great fish for this purpose, that that fish didn't exist until that point. I mean, nobody knows for sure. It's supposition. But but the argument, I mean, it, you know, because he can do what he wants. I mean, you know, and so I would simply say, and, and I've been caught up in this before, I would simply say that th this is fun for, for debate, but but it's, it's, it's a curiosity question. Just understand that the Hebrew in Jonah says great fish. And in the, and the, the Greek in the New Testament where Jesus refers to Jonah, it could mean great fish, whale, or sea monster. So, uh, and sea monster, not necessarily, I mean, just, it just meaning, you know, a large uh, beast uh, of the sea. No. Yes. It, exactly, and I'm glad you said that. I'm on. You know, I don't know if we'll get to it today, but I want you to come back in that last sentence that you just said. I want you to come back and say it again. Okay, <laughs> I'll, I'll help you. I'll help you remember because we're a little bit. We're a little bit. We're not there yet to where. But that is a perfect point. Um, and so, uh, let's see. We're not going to get to chapter two. Um, do we have anybody? Is Joe? Joe's not here. He's out, isn't he? Uh, uh, Mr. David's got it. Um, but thank you, Ethan. So let's look at some, some application. Let's look at the traits of Jonah, the traits of the prophet. Um, 
what were, what were some of his characteristics? Was he good? Was he bad? Was he something in between? Some have nothing good to say about Jonah. Uh, and all but exhaust a list of negative adjectives when they describe him. For, for example, there's a commentator, George L. Robinson, says he was jealous and vindictive. He was guilty of harboring, harboring a narrow, selfish patriotism. He was proud, self-centered, egotist, willful, fretful, pouting, and perverse. Um, another commentator by the name of John Willis says that he was self-centered and righteous, self-righteous, and that he was one who hated Gentiles and had other ungodly feelings. Uh, another source says Jonah is said to be guilty of spiritual arrogance and it is implied also guilty of attitudes and superiority and uh, exclusiveness in spite of Jonah's disobedience and possible prejudice God still dealt with the prophet patiently Jonah was probably like most individuals pretty good person who had some faults um, it's real easy to sit, look back, and make judgment. But it's easier to judge somebody else than it is us. We would surely be better off not to speculate, but to simply speak of Jonah in terms of what the Bible actually reveals about Jonah and about what he thought and he said and he did. So... You're right. No. Exactly. And we can't do it without God. Um, Self-sacrifice. Another application. When the lot fell on Jonah, it became apparent that the, uh, the, the, his sin had caused God to hurl the great storm against the ship uh, on which he was traveling. And he commendably said, pick me up and throw me into the sea for I know that on account of me, this great storm has come upon you. Jonah's willingness to sacrifice himself to save others is similar to the attitude expressed by Moses in Exodus 32, 32. It's similar to the attitude that Paul had in Romans 9, 1 through 3, as well as that of Jesus in his death on behalf of us sinners, Matthew 26, 28. Christians today should be willing to face pain or persecution if necessary for the Lord and for the salvation of fellow human beings. Somebody read John 15, 13. Alright, so greater love has no one to lay down his life for his friends. The sailors. What can we learn from the sailors? The sailors on the boat that were carrying Jonah to Tarshish, they were converted to faith in the Lord. Now we don't know if they, for, they gave up all of their other gods, but after seeing Jehovah's power revealed in the storm that almost sank their ship, they called on the Lord. They called on Him by name. And they prayed to him. And when they threw Jonah overboard, they saw the storm subside. And they feared the Lord greatly. And they offered sacrifice to the Lord. And they made vows to him. Were these sailors truly converted to the Lord? Did they join the Israelites and become part of God's chosen people by being circumcised? We don't have any evidence from the text that suggests that these, man, these men become proselytes. Uh, proselytes um, to Israel's faith but they may have become like the God fears spoken of in the New Testament Gentiles who feared and worshipped the one true God who had not fully committed themselves to Judaism by being circumcised and you see that mentioned in Acts chapter 10 uh, 1 and 2 dealing with Cornelius and it's also possible that because of their experience, they began to recognize the Lord as the most powerful of the gods. Perhaps like other Gentiles who express their faith in the Lord, like you see in Daniel 4.37, they may have determined to worship the Lord without denying the existence of their other gods. 
Any questions? Thank you all. We'll pick up chapter 2 next week.